I was on the road from economy rental car to College Avenue a few weeks ago, and suddenly I had no idea where I was. It only lasted for a few seconds. It was a very scary feeling. I had a sense of movement, but movement marked by no recognizable landscape features. Wide lanes, concrete strip malls, parking lots, power lines. I felt like I could be anywhere. And if you ever find yourself saying I could be anywhere, know that you are nowhere. And being nowhere and traveling through nowhere is profoundly disorienting. I couldn't place myself. I, I felt like I was falling horizontally through space. And in that moment of sudden loss, I craved a sign of place to bring me home to myself, to wake me up, some hint in the landscape. And the landscape is one of the oldest and most important ways to anchor the mind in space. And when you erase landscape, you pull up that anchor and you lose home. People in our city and across America think parks aren't priorities, all that stuff about nature and exercise being good for you. No, let's be businesslike about this and make businesslike decisions that bring more businesses to our community. And the problem, of course, is that actual businesses take exactly the opposite approach. Let's play a little game. Fast food restaurant or Macon Public Park. Fast food restaurant, Macon Public Park. Fast food restaurant, public, make, Macon Public Park. Fast food restaurant, public park. Why should Chick-fil-A and McDonald's have better flower beds than our parks? Why should a Kroger parking lot, the parking lot, have a better irrigation system? The shops at River Crossing, a sprawling strip mall in North Macon, spent $1.4 million to create their beautiful landscape, and every year they spend $120,000 to maintain the 1,750 new trees, 35,000 shrubs, and 930 flats of flowers spread over 125 different irrigation zones, all timed so that they don't spray any pedestrians. What a waste of money! And yet they're business people. What's going on? The city of Macon spends $17,000 a year to maintain the entirety of Tattnall Square Park right in the heart of downtown. Shops at River Crossing spends $18,000 on pine straw every year in a strip mall. What do they know that we don't know? I asked William Baker. He's a general manager at shops at River Crossing. Why do you spend so much money on landscape? He said this, and it's, I think this is brilliant philosophy. He said, the outside of our center is the inside of everybody else's center. The outside is the inside. The Romans read landscape as an outward expression of the inward spirit of cities, smart cities like Greenville and Chattanooga and Chicago. They know this. But many cities have lost that insight, and so many have lost a sense of place, of home. After seeing uh, statues and the park-like setting in beautiful shops at River Crossing, the general manager told me that his customers often praise the place by saying, and these words should frighten every Maconite, they say, I don't even feel like I'm in Macon. Now, I'm glad that Shops at River Crossing is using landscape to better the business. It's smart. But Shops at River Crossing is park-like. And the reason it's park-like is because it's not a real park any more than it's a real place. It's the facade of a park. It is a pseudo place. Its mission is not to get people in relationship with nature, their neighbor, art, or themselves. Its mission is to mimic a traditional park in order to get people in relationship with consumer products. It has no memory, it has no history, and people don't stay there any longer than it takes them to wolf down their Dairy Queen turtles. So how do you create a real park, a real place, with real relationships between people and nature? How do you, so that they don't have to ride on out to shops at River Crossing for a real place. First of all, I think it's time today that we destroyed some useless language. Thanks to the recreation movement, 50 years of dominance, the popular way of describing parks is to split them into active and passive spaces. Passive being 
natural woodsy area, a little tap to Frederick Law Olmsted and those cute little romantics who thought along with Emerson that nature actually was a healing influence. And instead, active space is the space where strong Americans engage in recreation activities. The problem with these terms is that they have no relation or little relation to reality. You cannot get a less active space than these tennis courts at Tattnall Square Park on this beautiful Saturday afternoon last week. There are no people on these four courts, or these courts, or these courts, or this court. Twelve courts, no sign of life. Now, they're sometimes very active, but they look like this most hours of most days of the year. You might as well take a picture of the moon and call that active space. This, on the other hand, is called passive space. Many groups of people seemingly actively engaged in all sorts of activities. Passive space, crowded with people from a very active festival. Passive space, children actively climbing a tree. We need to kill this language. <laughs> it is deluding us. Bad language is leading to bad decision for parks. So let's get rid of active space and passive space, and instead let's use single use and multi-use. The tennis courts are designed for tennis. Nobody argues with, it, with that. If you're not playing tennis on them, they will go unused, inactive. A basketball court at the ironically named Daisy Park, designed for basketball alone. When people are not playing basketball, it's empty. A concrete amphitheater, what a great idea. Wonderful during concert days once a month. Useless and ugly every other day of that month. This, on the other hand, is multi-use. <laughs> what does this look like to you? See, I've immediately gotten your imagination engaged. The Billabo is a Swiss toy which doesn't impose a specific play pattern on children. It could be a seat. Could be a drum, could be a salad bowl, could be a turtle, could be a cradle for a doll, a ship. I don't know what that is. I think that's an asthmatic smurf. Actually, Noah used this as, uh, for his potty training uh, but when he was too uh, tired to get to the next room. Not this actual one. I wouldn't have put this on my head. Um, but because it has no definitive shape, Children can come back to it again and again for imaginative play. So, how can we create park versions of billabos? Well, it turns out we've been doing it for years, as a matter of fact. We can create large fields for many different activities. This is Piedmont Park up in Atlanta. When we went up there, there were two football games, three ultimate frisbee games, a kickball game, and one poor man who was trying to hang glide in no wind. <laughs> All on one, in one park, multi-use, very smart. Washington Park, the best designed and most beautiful park in Macon. It's the home of our most successful running concert series, but there's no concrete stage, no concrete seating, and no band shell. And so you can have your concert in the, sa the same day you can have a wedding. Playground equipment tends to be single use. I think we can do better with playground equipment. Let me give you the instructions for a slide. You go up, you go down, you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down. You get bored and you hit your brother. Uh, I've seen children spend far more time inside trees in parks. Their imaginations engaged by the surprising, the unusual in the natural world. Rocks. They're the original billabos. No specific play pattern there. Children are instinctively drawn to them and we don't need the Swiss to invent them. So what can you do on a picnic table except sit and eat? All right, let me rephrase that. What can you do legally on a, crisp, on a picnic table? In Taiwan, they picnic on flat rocks under shady trees. And when nobody's picnicking, children can play on them. People can do yoga on them or they enhance the landscape for those just walking through. In Tattnall Square Park, we took a dead pine tree, cut it into stumps, we put it stumps in the pavilion during the winter to dry out. The children didn't wait for the spring. Here's one child landing his helicopter toy on one of the stumps. Another child skips across the top, both of them ignoring the, the picnic tables right here in the background, which are patiently waiting picnickers in the middle of winter. They've been a child magnet 
ever since. Lots of games of duck, duck, goose on these, but they've also been an adult magnet. This is a picnic going on, and this, this is my favorite, it is a drone circle, a spontaneous neighborhood event that filled the entire park with music, life, and a feeling of safety for the other park goers. And we tend in this town to favor macro programming in our parks, big, splashy, pricey concerts or festivals with hundreds or thousands of people, and that's great. We desperately need it to create a city culture. I'm not convinced it creates a park culture. Create a park culture, we need people to bring their own guitars to the park, to make their own music, so that the park sees life every day instead of emptiness, instead of a park holding its breath until the next big event rolls into town. And so one thing that we can do here today is just simply commit to go out into a park once a week and bring a frisbee or a guitar or a billabo and a friend. The other thing we can do is to not stay in one place when we go to a park because the most important feature about parks isn't the playground or the field or the splash pad or a fountain or even my beloved stump circle. The most important thing in a park is movement, procession. Great parks use landscape and art to invite park goers to uncover mystery and surprise everywhere in the park and in every season, allowing us to see landscape as changing and alive, like a scavenger hunt, encouraging and rewarding movement through space. At our second Sunday brunches in Washington Parks, while the parents sit and listen to the music, have you ever watched the children? They never stop moving. The entire park, one discovery, one surprise after another. How did the designers do this in such a small place? Water, rocks, plants, movement. And so it's strange to see so many park designs which envision the park only from above, as if parks were for the entertainment of satellites and very high-flying birds. This is not how we experience parks. We would never build a building this way without experiencing each of the rooms. Philip Johnson calls architecture the organization of procession. So the main event in architecture is how the building changes as one moves toward it and through its many rooms. It's the same way with parks. When we look at a park from the distance and as we approach, we watch it change, we enter its many rooms. And when we're held inside natural forms like this group of magnolias, we experience it not only as a visual experience, but a complete sensory engagement. We feel the air cool, we smell the blossoms, we hear the crunch of dead leaves, and we fully feel the presence of trees, the most generous living things on the planet. We live inside homes beneath rafters of trees. We walk on the bellies of trees. We read from the pulp and paste of trees. We sleep borne aloft by the bones of trees. And we will be buried inside of trees, placed in fields st studded with trees. Even when we don't exist, place matters to us. And places marked by landscape, by trees. Cemeteries were our first public parks. Frederick Law Olmsted's training grounds. And all parks include death in them. Flowers open, bloom and fall. Leaves yellow, brown and fall. Berries ripen and fall. Birth, death, rebirth birth, death, rebirth. And this celebration of seasonal change and our acceptance of time, this may be the greatest healing that parks can offer us. We need landscape art in our parks that reveal the complexity of nature, that heighten our attention to its ever-changing beauty. Craig Coleman, an art professor at Mercer University, had his class create Andy Goldsworthy-inspired artworks all over Tattnall Square Park. Beautiful, organic art designed to decay and die. My seven-year-old son, Noah, was delighted when he stumbled across this recycle sign made of nuts on the playground, and he immediately went off searching to find some natural objects to make his own art piece, procession, movement. And these areas with his creation in the middle of Tattnall Square Park, he was very proud of this. But then he got into a very complex relationship with nature. Because the next day, his art piece had been toppled by the wind. And then the entire piece was swallowed up by time. And he was really disturbed 
pissed off at the natural world's seemingly hostile treatment of his work. He became a little Stephen Crane for a while. Here he is looking at a Valentine's Day art piece that Craig Coleman created with installment artist Katie Olmsted, and he looks really cute there, but what he was really doing was trying to destroy the piece with his foot. <laughs> he was angry that his art had been destroyed, and so he wanted to destroy something else. He couldn't accept that his art wouldn't stand forever. He couldn't accept time, couldn't accept change. Now this is important for most children, but this is especially important for Noah. His mother, my wife Anya, has stage four cancer. He knows that now. He woke up earlier this week from a nightmare in which he watched his mother slip from the top of a Ferris wheel and disappear into the space below. And we hope and expect a long life for Noah's mom. But we both believe that he does not need a culture that denies time, denies sickness, denies death. He needs to acknowledge change, decay, mortality, but he has to feel that his smallness matters, that his life matters, that this world matters. Landscape comes from the Danish word landskaft or landskip, shaped land, organized wildness. Landscape shapes the natural world with the natural world, creating an entrance into mystery, into the unknowable. A week after his first forays into organic art, Noah was at it again. He couldn't help himself, making artistic secondhand goals worthies by the side of the house. But there was something new now. Because when we'd pass by, he'd point to the piece and he'd say, look, Daddy, the leaves have fallen off. Or, see, that twig was blown over. And he wasn't angry. He said this with a sense of wonder, as though his art had simply taken on a different shape. And he didn't try to fix it. And he never knocked it down. It's still there now. It's a hard, hard life this little life. If it's not hard now for you, just you wait. It will be soon. We will all be shorn from our bearings. We will all have to live with disorientation. We will all have to live with loss. But place, art of land, art of sky, of stone and trees and water, out of our hands, these small, changing, fragile orders can help us find ourselves again before we've driven too far to recall where we really belong. Home. 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 Thank you.